Welcome back to In Light of the Gospel, episode 12. My name is Dan Blatz. Today you're going to be introduced to someone named Pete Harder. I personally don't know him very well myself, and I got to know a lot about him in this podcast. You're going to want to stick around to the end. This story is crazy. Um, it's something that could easily have a movie written about it. It's, uh, it's almost fantastical. I pray for him that he uh, would walk faithfully after all the craziness that he's had to experience in his life from growing up pretty much without a dad for many years and then uh, finding his mom murdered to uh, seeing his dad in prison for 15 years. The story is just out of this world. Uh, it's caused so much hurt, so much struggle in his life, in his family's life, his siblings, uh, obviously loss of his mom and uh, the story just sounds devastating and it would be devastating if it wasn't for the hope that he has found in Christ. He found it initially as a boy, went completely astray, and uh, in the last three or four years has come to realize who he is in Christ and has left off the old man and um, has started afresh. And he's walking faithfully now. I uh, hope you keep him in mind and uh, let him know how encouraged you by this story you were. Thanks again. So I've heard a lot of people call you Petey. Yep. Is that what you go by? And depending depending on the group I'm, uh, that I'm in, so Peter or Petey, or are you Pete, or are Pete, you all three? All three. Okay. Yeah. So Pete, more or less, guys at work and new people that I meet. Um, Petey is more the nickname I was given at a from youth from, from oh, yeah. te teenage years. So, um, yeah. So Peter, not so much. That's a okay. That's doesn't I, happen. I had it often. in my phone as Peter. I, I coached <laughs> yeah. your two yeah. kids in, that's right. in baseball, right? And somehow mm -hmm. I got it in there as Peter and Shady. Yeah. So, and which is fine. Yeah. But all right. There's enough Mennonite names to go around anyway. Yeah, Peter and Pete is a pretty common one. Yeah. Petey kind of throws it off a little bit. It does, yeah. You were uh, you were born and raised in Mexico? or uh, Born in Paraguay. Paraguay, South yeah, America, right. yeah. So so do you know a lot of the guys from our church, like Pete Penner and Pete John Fries and those I've guys? I've met them, but I, so we connect because of uh, the Terare. Okay, I was just going to ask about yeah. that. That I can sip with it with with anyone all day long, so yeah. I'm I'm okay with that. I did uh, <laughs> I did youth for quite a number of years with John Friesen. He always bought, yeah. brought that tan day along, and yeah. I actually got to the point where I was like, "Yeah, hey, pass me some." Yeah, especially if it's a little bit hot out or something. Oh it's yeah, it's pretty refreshing. Yeah, it's it's nice to have. So you were born and raised there. Yeah. So my parents would have originated from Mexico when they were both children. They moved or moved to, to Paraguay with with their parents then. Um, so I was born in '86. Okay. Um, second to oldest, uh, one one older sister, and then I have, we're eight siblings in all together. Okay. So I'm the oldest boy, one one older sister. There you go. So you yeah. had a lot of the responsibility of the younger family. Yeah. Younger of the family. Mm -hmm. And uh, you you were educated there, or? Yeah, I can remember going to school. So born and raised in the old colony setting as well. Um, so would have gone to school at the age of six. I can remember. I think my first day walking to school. Okay. In, in the row of boys, as the youngest, you're in the front, and the older ones always get to the back. I can remember walking across our little town, going to school. We lived at the other end of where the school was, but then later on, we moved to right beside the school, and then also in front of the school across the road. So you're never too far to walk. Never too far, no. So, uh, yeah, I would have gone to school there for probably th six, seven, eight years, and then at the age of nine, sometime, it was in January of 96, we moved to Ontario. So you were only four years old? Uh, no, 96. Oh, 96, 96 10 years old. Yeah. 10 years old. I was nine going on 10 that year. Okay. So, yeah. But yeah, so being born there, a um, little bit of background um, with um, at home. Dad was not much around from uh, from a young age on already. He he worked uh, away from the colony, so it would have been in the city, which would have been probably about two, two and a half hour drive okay. in a vehicle. So mom was left with the children a lot of times for months on at a time, even not just right. months uh, at a time. Months at a time, yeah. And so I can I can't remember much of him there. Just little glimpses of dad being around. Um, my mom would have said later on in life that I, I, I followed her around like a like the like a little boy would have followed dad around, uh, waiting for dad to come home. I see. And so it was always in me to to want my dad around. Um, I, th I think there's a. An innate natural urge to have that that male leadership yeah. in your life, right? You know, yeah. You won't be able to define it or explain it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I can remember being with my friend from across the road at our place that we lived there at the one time. I would be around his place often because his dad would have been around if they were working. I'd just go tag along because it was a place to 
where boys would be. Mm. If there's men somewhere, I'd go. Were you in, out in the country then? Did you have access to tools and farm equipment, things like that? Yeah, so it would have been like farm lifestyle. Um, we would have had cattle. Um, uh, not much to do on the field. Um, Mom, I don't, I don't remember exactly what we would have been off. Wealthy, not much. We didn't have a whole lot to, to live off of. I can remember that much. And your siblings came all pretty quick, are they? Yeah, we're all pretty close age? together. Yeah, my older sister, we're a year and a couple months apart, and same with the rest of Almost on. all the way down. Yeah. So here he, he came home and deposited yeah. seeds, so to yeah. speak. Exactly. Yeah, that's what it, from what I, from what I understand, that's wow. what, that would have happened. Yeah. What did he do for work at this time? What was he doing? Um, I don't know what he did much for work. I know he's, he says that he's done like ranch work, like so cowboy style. I remember seeing a picture from back in the 80s. He would have been, it would have been bell bottoms, uh, the cowboy hats. He would have been yeah. like a ranch hand. But and he also worked in the city. So pretty common know. that a cowboy would be gone yeah, for exactly. a long time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so being gone in the city, um, the life he lived was uh, his. was definitely not uh, one that he'd be proud of to, to, to speak about, but I don't know much of the details. Hmm. And so that was a Paraguay life there. So I can remember a few of my aunts and uncles, my grandparents, um, they've all gone now. They've all passed from both sides of my parents. Is that so, right? Yeah. Those first nine years of your life, did you, do you think of them at all with fondness, or do they just seem like a blur? Or? A bit of a blur, but yeah, I can. It's just the, your childhood years. I can remember some good times for sure. Like because Dad was not much around, even though I feared him a lot, there was not. There's a, one incident where I can remember him. The directed his anger at me, because he had a, a gun in the house. I think it was in a closet somewhere. And me and a friend of mine had gotten our hands on it. And oh, we, boy. we played around pretending to shoot each other. Now, from the anger that he had, I'm not sure if it was a loaded gun and could have gone off pretty easy. And God Likely his, he would have had it. God, God yeah. had his hand on us and we didn't kill. I didn't kill him or he didn't kill me. Wow. As far as two little, probably six, seven-year-old boys were done. And this was a rifle, right? So, um, and I can, and that's one incident. But I mean, I, I remember him trying to teach me to shoot at a young age with a, with a handgun. He, okay. always, he always had a gun, typically, with him. So, And, and that was just that's fun just, target shooting? Yeah, that would, that would have been a target shooting time. And so he did try when he did come home. If it wasn't... Because uh, I, I can't remember him ever being a drunk at home. I know he did drink, but never a drunk at home as far as that went. But he always had alcohol around him. Okay. As far as that went. So then nine years old, he, yeah. him and his your, your mom packed up and yep. they all moved here. So... One of my dad's brothers um, was really, he had uh, come to Christ and to know the Lord, and he was really hurting for his brothers and his siblings. And so, like, so my dad and then my family directly, he wanted them to, us to know the Lord as well. And so he came to Paraguay one time to visit and to share the gospel. And I think my mom really right away uh, just grabbed onto that. I don't remember much about it, but she wanted something. Yeah, she wanted something, and the life she was living in, I can obviously imagine it was tough with dad and stuff. So um, he he made it happen that we could come here. He used to work on the paperwork because that that takes a long time typically. So uh, through him, we got to Ontario. I can remember. So this is South America. I've never seen snow in my life. So yeah. nine years old, we got off the airport in Toronto, where I think it was, and walk out the door. It was winter. It was winter. It was January, February. Oh, oh. <laughs> That'd be a shock. Yeah, because I remember my aunt and uncle come there, and they had a bunch of jackets and stuff, and not, way too big for us. They didn't know what, I mean, they knew the children's sizes or ages, but not sizes much, and they didn't, so they just brought whatever they could to yeah. keep us warm. And so I seen snow for the first time. That was amazing. Wow. Yeah. Was that, uh, did it feel like you were onto some new thing, some good thing, or did it feel like, oh, no, what are we doing? I can't remember that. There's a lot of feelings that I... I from my past traveled years, I, I've, uh, I don't have a lot of recollection of them. Um, I don't know. I think I buried a lot of it, I think. I was just going to ask, do you think you kind of blocked it out? I think I blocked a lot. Thinking back now, there's things that went on. Because there's things that went on with my dad that I don't have clear memories of, but I know that were bad. Um, would have been with other women or not with him, too. Um, there's things that I can remember being in different hotel rooms. But blocking things, like looking back now, I think I blocked a lot from from, I see. from my memory. But and those so, couple things, like him teaching you to shoot, things like that, it almost felt like those were the moments where he, he did care for you. Yeah. It was some genuine yeah. love. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, Your mom, she was patient and kind and yeah. good? or from what I can remember, she was, uh, yeah, I loved her uh, dearly. Um, 
Yeah, she had her times. Yeah, she must have been with the kids. But I mean, overall, yeah, um, yeah, she was a kind woman, gentle. Um, she loved the Lord. When she came to know the Lord, she was. She and that was about that time when you yeah, came. Yeah, it Canada? must have been around that time. I don't remember her conversion, but I'm, I'm assuming it was around that time because so coming to Canada then in '96, uh, living with my uncle that brought us here for a few months, and so for two brothers I know that wasn't easy for them. My dad and his brother. It wasn't easy for them, but that was the start we had. And so from there, we think we moved to Port Rowan. And so there's a lot of my childhood years in Port Rowan that I can remember. Okay. And so growing up, went to public school there, walking to school. Um, Always now, walking to school. Eh? Nowadays, I think about it. If, if my nine, ten-year-old now walk to town, I'm my, my wife wouldn't allow it yet. Yeah. Right? It's always got a supervision, but we walked to school. And mom and dad never thought of it twice, never I don't think. Yeah, we walked across town. And so then you learned English pretty quick. Yeah, actually, my first uh, first few months in school were actually in Langton, so with my cousins that we moved in with, and it was uh, so they were the English, so they were born and raised in Canada. Um, so coming to school for uh, for me now, my cousin my age it would have been grade three. It wasn't cool for him to have a Mennonite kid with him around oh, that didn't speak English. So I can remember him pushing me off kind of the side. Didn't want to have a straggler along him. So that was yeah. rough, a bit tougher for me. But yeah, I taught it. I learned English then and then going to school that obviously for a while there, I thought I had forgotten how to speak German. I would like mom always, I think as far as I remember, mom and dad would speak German to us. We'd always speak English back as, as we grew up, as most yeah. men kids that do. That was here. what I did. Eh? Yeah. You're in Ontario, right? So yeah, we went there. Um, went to, I can remember going to, so that was nine, 10. And then, um, and now your dad was around. Yeah. So that dad was around, um, and what, and what seemed good, I don't know, um, don't know where he would have gotten saved, um, or when it would have been, but we started going to, um, at first it was the MB church in Port Rowan, cause that's where my uncle went at the time. But then later on we went to Houghton center before, so let us gospel was in Houghton center yep. prior to this. Was uh, Henry Weave, Henry and Tina already leading there? No, it was Richard and Elizabeth Ham. Before that, wow. Yeah, so I remember, I don't know if you ever met Richard Ham or not. No, I never did. Yeah, uh, wonderful man. He's gone to be with Lord already. But So they were the pastor couple, and then Henry and Tina would have been a deacon couple. Mm -hmm. And so, but this, I think it was one summer, just as we started going there, there was a, um, a VBS style. It would have been all in Simcoe, though. And there's an older couple from Port Rowan that had a yellow school bus and they would uh, drive around and pick up children to go to that VBS. It was, I think, on a week. I don't know if it would have been a week or two. Even. Most VBSs were during the week, yeah. almost all day, almost like a school, right? Yeah. And so they, they came and I can't, I still can't remember or even believe it either how, you know, my, our parents would just let us go. At yeah. The, and, but we went. And so that's where I heard the gospel. Uh, clearly. Like 9, 10, 12 yeah. years old. Yeah, so. 9, 10, probably would have been 10 already at that time. Yeah, hearing the gospel and this couple that picked us up, you know, he would share with the gospel with us on, on the way to school or to the church on the way back. Oh, that's cool. And after the VBS was over, they they they, they picked us up every Sunday with that same school bus. And uh, I can remember going with them on a, on a regular basis. Mom and dad would go to Houghton Center and we kids would go with uh, to this church. And, For Sunday morning? Yeah. Okay. It was in Simcoe. Oh, what's the church called now? It's right on the edge of town going out of Simcoe, Bethel Baptist. Okay. That had been a Baptist church. And so they always had a had a, a, a children's school wing there, like a Sunday school classroom, separate from the building of the church. So, yeah, hearing the gospel there, um, all the Bible stories, David and Goliath and all of them, they became real to me and new to me. And I just, yeah. I soaked it all in. I, I memorized scripture. Like, that was always the thing. You know, memorize scripture. You um Learn the books of the Bible. You do games. You do. You Sing get points. Songs. And oh yeah, that was my thing. And I just my mind just grabbed it. And I like, could, did did the gospel become very real to you at that age already? At that age, yeah. And I was, and I like for me, you know, I wanted to be whatever these people were offering. I wanted it, right? And so if there was an altar call, so to say, you know, I'd go up almost every time. I I, I didn't understand salvation at that time, but I can remember that. I think it was the second time that I had done that. But the teacher took me aside into the hallway and the staircase and we sat down and he just explained it to me that, you know, to accept Christ into my heart and that, uh, then I can be born again. And so I did that there. He prayed with me. And so being born again like that, I can remember. And, uh, so that was, I think it would have been 11 already. 
going on 12. Were you uh, were you kind of a rebellious kid, or were you a pretty quiet, compliant? At that, at that age there, no, I was a Sunday school little church boy. Yeah. Um, I mean, rebellious at home, I don't know. I think if my mom could probably have better see what I do with my siblings, but I can, don't remember being in this. Like, at that age, in trouble at a that, lot. At no. that age, not yet, no. Um, that came later. Okay. And so, yeah, I uh, came to know, you know, Jesus at that time, the gospel. Um, and uh, another thing that I got, to, my parents allowed me to get baptized at that church at that young age. Oh, wow. And uh, I thought about it years down the road, and even in my later years now, thinking about, you know, getting baptized again, maybe. Like, did you really understand the yeah. gospel, truly? Yeah, and, but I mean, if I look back, the day of my baptism, what I can remember is the day I was in the, it was in the water there, it was a uh, immersion, but I can remember the question being clearly asked, you know, do you believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? And uh, that was a clear yes for me, I can remember that so clearly that, it's not a. I'm not second guessing was I baptized in real the real way or not, and so I've, I've I'm at peace with not doing it again if it. Right. But I mean that was always a thought that came later on in my life. See, when I was baptized at Old Colony, I was mm-hmm. I was sincere in that I believed that God was the Father, I believed that Jesus was the Son, I believed that there was a Holy Spirit. Those I had no doubt about that. Yeah. But it wasn't until I was 21 after we got married that that I recognized that when Jesus died on the cross, it was for me. Yeah. My sins are what held him there. You know, mm-hmm. he he was suffering and dying as if he were a criminal, me, the criminal. Yeah. You know, and until then it was just, yeah, of course Jesus died for sinners. Yeah. It was just this generic acceptance yeah. of that fact, but it didn't really enter my heart, right? Yeah. So to me, I don't I, I know I got born again when I was twenty one years old and yeah. I first finally saw the cross. Paul says in Galatians um, Jesus Christ, before whose eyes Jesus Christ happens, evidently set forth, crucified among you. Mm-hmm. Jesus never went to Galatia. Yeah. Paul went to Galatia. He preached the gospel, and he says Christ was set forth, crucified among you. And so to me, it's like when you see the cross, when you really see what Jesus has done, that's when you receive the Spirit, yeah, right? Exactly. So yeah. I don't know, obviously, mm-hmm. in your situation, sometimes yeah. really young people, they can be very easily persuaded mm-hmm. to, to you know, pray a prayer or... Yeah. Ask Jesus into their heart. Yeah. But. No, from what I felt in my heart, I felt sincere, right? And so I've never doubted that in my mind. I mean, yeah, doubts have come later, but I do believe that I was baptized um, upon the con- a confession of my faith, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I can remember being, and so this old couple that would drive us to, to the church back and forth, I can't, can't remember now if he gave me a Bible, a brand new Bible when I got baptized or when I got born again at that age, but I got a brand new Bible, and that was the uh, King James black leather had the heart it was in that case so the new smell bible so i got nice. that bible and i still have the bible i've lost some pages but i wore that bible out and i've i marked verses even going into my teenage years a little bit but i wore that bible thin that's cool and so yeah that was that's uh, a neat thing to hang on yeah. to pass on to james one day or something. yeah exactly right and so but yeah so shortly after that for some reason my parents decided to take us out of that church and make us go as a family to houghton center so that's that was uh, that would obviously be what parents would do is take children with the church. So right, we started going there. My parents got involved. They became a deacon couple. As um, I'm not sure if it would have been exactly with Henry and Tina or after, but they were a deacon couple with them anyways. So Henry and Tina had a son, Victor. A year is between me and my uh, other brother, and so we the three of us were pals. I see. And so we hung out. I never acquainted you with Victor for some reason. No. I knew Victor when he was like 15, 16. Yeah. That's when I first met him. So those years then we would have been then I would have been in Mexico already. But so from yeah, so twelve to fourteen to two, three years that we would would have been very close in our childhood years. Okay. So yeah, we hung out with the, the Weebs often. Um so my parents um took us out of public school through all that because it was um homeschool was um one of the things that my parents were trying to pursue trying to keep us more away from the world and the views of the world yeah and so um we did homeschool for one year i'm sure it was hard for my mom because i know how, how old were you then do you remember that would have been already yeah because i had finished grade six in walsingham so i would have been 13 okay yeah yeah because i did my three grade three four and five in Port row and then went in grade grade six in waltzing when it was still the public school so now it's the old colony private school okay used to be the public school and so yeah those were the years you know here in ontario uh, 13 almost 14 and then my parents decided or that my dad decided he wanted to move to mexico 
he he liked the freedom of uh, you know Mexico or Paraguay, but he wanted to go to Mexico. He he came from Mexico. He wanted to move back there, and um, he started work. We started uh, doing the field work that most men and families would do. We'd go pick cucumbers. You went down. Oh, you were picking cucumbers here. here. Yeah. So okay. first of all, we'd be doing the summer work here, cucumbers. Uh, I can remember doing tomatoes, some corn in the late fall, October when it got really cold already. Mm-hmm. And so my dad saved whatever he could, and uh, he worked at Hoover's, looking at his uh, pay stub that I found in one of his old cases a while ago. It was like for nine bucks an hour or something oh, like yeah. that, and family of eight. All right, and so That'd but, be yeah, tough. he saved some money, and uh, we moved to Mexico. And I can remember that was uh, hard for me because almost 14 years of, of age. All and, your friends. Yeah, my friends, and um, that's a time in a boy's life or a young, young man's life where he's changing. Didn't know where to go with some things, and so uh, I asked Dad why he wanted to go to Mexico. But he said he wanted to buy land there, and he was buying land for us one day. To, he was he wanted to give us children something, mm. and so I can remember uh, Henry and Tina. We were not on board with the with the ideas all the way, but I mean they let us. Obviously, us, us go. It was my parents' decision, mm-hmm. and so we went. And so yeah, we moved to Mexico when uh, when I was. It was in October. That's my, when I would have turned 14, I think two weeks prior, my 14th birthday. So then I had to try to make new friends at that age, and that's just, oh, it's a, which is a bit harder. But I went to an EM, EMMC church there. There was a... I was down in Durango? Yep, Durango, Mexico. And so I went to church there, started making friends. More, I made a connection right away with my neighbor, our neighbor boy, my age. So me and him became close friends. That would have been my new best friend at the time. Um, so as far as being a, a troublemaker, coming from 13, 14, like moving from Canada to Mexico, was nothing big going on yet um, for me. My rebellion came in where my 15, 16 years of age there. And so moved to Mexico, made some friends um, in the church with the youth. I enjoyed youth all the time, but I had connections with the uh, DARPs. Their little town boys my age, so my one of my best friends there, and then all the other boys, and they would go away on Sundays. That was the thing, you know. They're on the road on Sundays. Uh, most of them it was uh, liquor, yeah, and so alcohol, smoking, and drugs. That was very common then already. Very common, yeah. So you had your Thursday nights where they'd be gone, and Saturdays and Sundays, depending on the age you're at and what you're allowed to do. And so, uh, so my dad with the life, so we bought a we bought a small farm. And then didn't take long. We bought our neighboring farm, which was a lot bigger. So we had an apple orchard. We had my dad started buying cattle, so we started milking cows. Apples down the wrong way. Yeah. So we started uh, milking cows, trying to raise some beef. Uh, some you know we just raised beef for uh, for sale. Um, worked the land. So he kept you busy. Yeah. So that was one thing. I, yeah, were you schooling then still, or were you, did you uh, just drop out? Mom wanted to try to do homeschool, but as a 14-year-old boy, yeah, you have land now. Yeah, uh, right keep us, You couldn't keep us contained. So we were on the field, and obviously with Dad, we, he bought sheep. That was his big thing. Besides okay. the cattle, the cattle was just enough to keep, the, you know, you had the milk, and you could make your own. Yeah, you had you had your normal necessities for the, for the house and the sheep. He bought a lot of sheep, so then me and my younger brother would have been the shepherd boys. I see. So that was interesting. Um, but he would uh, travel back and forth to Canada still. He would uh, help a lot of the Mennonites move from there to Canada. A lot of the men there didn't own a vehicle, couldn't drive, or didn't dare themselves to drive across country yet like that. So he would drive hmm. often for So he was families. still gone for a lot, yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah, so when he would do that, he'd be gone for maybe about a week or so because he'd travel three days there. And three now, when back. he was in Canada and he was working at Hoover and all that, did you did you get close to him then? Um Closer, yeah, but there's always a, a disconnect because uh, uh, it might have been from his part too, not knowing how to connect, maybe yeah. being raised Didn't the way he was. was a boy, even. yeah, exactly. So, but I can remember wanting to be like my dad, he would go to work and come home. And but with him being gone, I should say this from a young age on, um, I had a lot of fear in me, um, for someone to, to, uh, that I loved to leave me. So when dad wasn't around, that was a big thing for me. And then I can remember the one time dad did night shift for some reason. And it might have been just for a season. It was just for a season. But I can remember waiting by the window, waiting for him to come home. Feeling like he's gone. Yeah, feeling like he's gone. And that was a feeling that was in my heart. I knew that he wasn't gone. He wasn't doing anything wrong. I knew that he was working. 
but the fear and the anxiety that I had that he wasn't home when it was dark, it was just too much for me. Like to it. me, it almost sounds like you've made some connections already in your own heart and mind. Oh, yeah. When that first 10 years of your life without your dad, more or less, yeah. put that kind of anxiety and fear yeah. into you, right? Like, what if this all goes away? Yeah. And so that, then the same thing in Mexico, you know, then he's more, he's gone more. And because you're, you know, the tendency when you're in Mexico, you know, have your own farm, you're more freedom, you're, you're not tied to a time clock, you know, punch in at work in the morning or come home, you know, you're your own, you're, you're your own boss, you're your own man. So he was that. And, and then he started being gone for weeks again, coming, traveling back and forth. But then also, you know, he got he connected with friends at his age, like men. Um, like I said, he never was an alcoholic at home, but when he was with his friends, there was always booze. And Even and, after uh, having drink. been a you yeah. know, deacon in the church and leading out and yeah. things like that, now mm -hmm. he was... Yeah, because I always struggled growing up with, when he was a deacon, you know, he struggled with uh, trying to quit smoking, you know, and he taught us not to smoke, not to drink. But uh, he would have it on the, he would have it with, a, uh, you know, every now and then. Smoking, he would try to quit a few times, and it never seemed to hold hmm. or last long. And so, but yeah, so I always struggled with that. I always prayed for him as a little boy. I always prayed for him to to be to be able to quit that one day. And so, yeah, so then he started being gone. And then when he was gone late at night again, when he'd come home, I can remember sleeping or being in the bed in, in my bed, waiting for the truck to roll in again. Hmm. And that anxiety was still there, the fear. And so. Uh, with traveling back and forth, I think somehow he got mixed up in with uh, hauling drugs. With those kind Probably of trips, probably realized how much money he could make. Yeah, just bringing some stuff across the border, eh? Yeah. So he started coming home with, uh, you know, some newer trucks every now and then, and you know, people start talking. As soon as a man comes home with a new truck, people start talking, and so he was careful. Like he tried to sell a few things off. He would sell them and what, what not all, to try to make that to be his profit. But I mean, I think, uh, and it was evident. Would have been in 02 then already. So the year 2000, we were moved to Mexico when I was 14. But in 02, he went to prison. He got caught at the border of Mexico and the U.S. border in New Mexico. And so for smuggling drugs. So that was hard for my mom then too. And I was, I think it would have been 15. Man, what a change. Here yeah. she's homeschooling her kids, deacons yeah. of the church. Go out there now, her husband's in yeah. prison for smuggling drugs. Yeah, so. Sheesh. Yeah, and so for me, yeah, 15, 16 might have been. Yeah, 15 going on 16. I didn't know what to think of it. And so mom was struggling. She had a hard time with it, obviously. Um, and she, and so then my uncle, my dad's brother, the one that helped us was John, John Harder at the time. Um, he came down to try to help with that again to see if he could. So he came down to our place, took mom, went to the border to see what went on, or if he, when he can get out at least. Um, so he was in prison then for 13 months, so just over a year. Okay. And so that year is when my rebellion started. Dad wasn't around. Yeah. Dad was always when Dad was around. I was clean. I was trying to be clean as a as a whistle. Um, he had the fear in us that, that disobey him was not an option. And so he had a temper. And so when he was around, I did what I could to not get in his way. And so when he was gone now for a year, as much as I love my mom, I ran all over her. I always thought now I was the man of the house. And so I kind of started almost acting like your dad. Yeah, exactly. So I started hanging out with her. Instead of going to youth, I would, that would be my excuse to get off the property. But then I would hang out with the kids, the guys in the DARPA in the, in the towns there. So I started smoking, drinking. Um, I, I, always, I always stayed away from drugs. I never got into them. I had one time seen a friend of mine with cocaine. He had come from Ontario to Mexico for the winter, like most, like, like a lot of them do. And he had a little container of cocaine. I can just remember him snorting that the one day. And it never Didn't appealed to me. Mm -hmm. It was scary because I, I had just heard of what drugs could do. But yeah, smoking and, and drinking. So I would drink on the weekends. I was, I would drink as much as I could. And so, and then obviously when you start smoking, you think you're just going to do a couple here and there, but then it becomes an addiction. So then I had to find a way to buy this now. I didn't have an income. I was, right. I lived at home. Alcohol where, and tobacco aren't free. No, and we're uh, so living at home. You know, mom, and dad provide for everything. I'm on a farm. I'm, I don't have a day job. I don't. I didn't have an allowance. And now with dad being in prison, mom had to once again try to fend for the for the food on the table. Mm -hmm. So because we had the farm, we had already put the so people. So we had a, a couple other or another uh, family. They would come and um, 
plant the crop in our field and they would take it off and they would give us a little bit for using our field. But then we had the cattle, the sheep, so we, mom would sell off things that we that she could to, to yeah. make ends meet. And there were some other Mexican friends that my dad had connection with that would come and help out, but I don't think it was a good thing as far as between the relationship with my dad and these men went. But we got by, but I would... So not having money, but having these addictions, I would steal from my mom's purse as much as I could. Whatever little bit yeah, she had, Whatever right? change she had, I would uh, rip her off that way. And so, and she she prayed for me. And, and for her first few times that I would leave the property, I can remember her coming, coming with her minivan and my younger siblings, because that wasn't home. But anyway, she came and picked me up. I was in the bunch of guys and girls, and I had driven there with my bicycle, me and, me and, me and my buddies. And she wanted me to come home, and so it was embarrassing for 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 oh, your yeah. mom to come pick you up. So I had to get in the van, and my bike stayed there. My buddies had to drag the bike all the way home, and we had it gone for a long drive. This was already at night and in the dark, so that was embarrassing for me. And then um, I can remember that one time I had a girlfriend where I was at her her place too. Mom did the same thing. She came to that door and pulled me out and got me to come home. And um, your dad was still in prison. Yeah, at that wow. time. So mom did her best to try to force me. So you didn't really contribute much at that point? No, I mean, I did do the work on the field, and during the day, I can remember going on the field, start plowing, get bored, get off the tractor. That would least my, I'm out in the field from there, I just walk off and go hang out somewhere at the store, and just just be lazy, just hang out with my buddies. Mm. And so that wasn't easy for, for, for mom. And so, yeah, but as, as, at some point, my mom knew that she couldn't pull me off the street. And so she did what any Christian woman would have done. She got on her knees and prayed. And prayed and prayed and so my older sister i can remember i come home drunk at night and we just would go to bed and my sister said you know that mom's in her room just praying and that just struck me to the core because i had i knew the truth i knew the gospel i knew i had been born again but i had thrown it away and just was living living for the flesh and so she had gone to a bible school for three months at that at that time your sister I think yeah, I think around that time and she came home and she was just on fire for the Lord and she mm. and so she had she just told me straight to my face that I turned on my back on God and I just couldn't handle that and I said no way that's not true but um, and so then the youth there where we were attending was growing and there was a lot of revival happening at the time and so I went to there was a, a youth revival weekend in chihuahua would have been an eight hour drive for, for us oh, yeah, so that's... i was just at the age where i was allowed to go so this is when you're away for the weekend you would be 16 or older i believe it was so i really wanted to go not, i'm not even sure why i wanted to go but i just wanted to get away from home um i was still drinking still smoking but i wanted to go and i think dad was he out then already or not i can't remember now but i went anyways yeah i think he was i think he was just out but he allowed me to go, so I went, and that was a revival that I will never forget either, right? And so I, I there I, I dedicated my life back to where I didn't want to live the way I lived, and I wanted, I was addicted to tobacco already, and I didn't know how to quit. I had, I had already tried on my own, and it just wasn't working. And so I remember just praying that, you know, God, I give you this, because through the revival somehow, they said that, uh, you know, you bring God your problems, don't clean up your act, and then try to come to God. Mm -hmm. And so... I just said in prayer that, you know, I gave it all to him. He can do with what he wants. And so coming home from that revival weekend, I had a pack of smokes in my truck or dad's truck that I would drive then. And it was harvest season for the for the apples. So I was supposed to go grab a few guys out of town that could come and help. And I can remember I took the pack of smokes out of the console and looked at it and just crunched it and threw it out the window. I didn't need it anymore. Never gone back? Later on, I did again. So that was <laughs> sad to say, but yeah, that was an answer to prayer there, obviously. But um, I he's a, faithful even when he we're is not. faithful, yeah. And so I've taken comfort in the scripture when he says, "I know a righteous man falls seven times, but he, in order to fall seven times, you have to get back up." Yeah. And I feel like I've fallen around almost that amount of time sometimes. So. Wow. But yeah, so there, there I, but so yeah, then with mom, with the year that dad was gone, you know, being a rebel, hurting mom so much, I'd gone to the revival weekend in Chihuahua come back and you know the youth was just thriving and so people were coming to the Lord uh, different youth from the colonies that were 
were stuck in the religious settings that, that were not allowed to even go to a different church. You know, they were just coming to the Lord and, you know what, if mom and dad kick me off the yard, so be it. And so it was just a revival happening and I was in the middle of it and it was just amazing to see. We had different revival evenings and another man that would have been a powerful man in my life there that I looked up to is uh, Richard Harms. That sounds familiar. He would have been, he would have been from Ontario. He would have been a, a farmer here years ago. And anyways, he was a gospel preacher. And so he preached there. And, um, you know, I prayed with him and I prayed with uh, just trying to get to know the Lord better and just to clean up my act or let him deal with deal with my mess. And so I remember the one night after we had finished our, it was a few nights where we had evening services and it was on forgiveness and stuff. And so I had to deal with, I went home that night. Mom and dad were there and we went home and I remember the children all went to their rooms and dad went to his room and mom went to the kitchen like she would normally do. And I just followed her in the kitchen. I just asked her to forgive me for the wrong that I'd done her. And so we hugged. Uh, I think she cried and I cried. And so it was a, it was a, a special moment for, for me and her. Yeah. Um, and somewhere around that time, my older sister got, was getting married and she moved to Ontario to get married here. And so, uh, it would have been when I was 17. So yeah, dad was in prison for a year and a month, so 13 months, and he was out for a little bit. can't remember now. It was in, not even a year. Anyway, so I had gone to, so yeah, I had done the revival, come to the back to the Lord, you know, made things right, right with my mom. And um, I had gone to Bible school that would have been from January to March in Chihuahua. I'd, I'd done one year there. Okay. And I remember my dad asked dad if I could go. And uh, he didn't say yes or no. It was about 10,000 pesos at the time. And so... That was a significant amount? At that time, yeah, it would have been a little... It was a bit tough to swallow, depending on your income there. I remember Dad offered me, he said, um, you can do that, I'll pay for that, or you stay home and I'll just buy you a car. But I said, no, I want to go to school instead. Mm. And so I'm not sure what his thinking was, why he wanted... I mean, yeah, you want you want your oldest boy home to help with the farm, maybe, but yeah, but uh, but I wanted to go. I can remember asking the youth leader at the time. I asked him about that. What should I do? Should I stay home, or should I go? And I'm not sure exactly what the advice was, but um, what I took from that, I think I, I was going to go instead. And so I and he that was just a three month stretch. Yeah, three month stretch being away from home. So that was a new experience for me there too, being away from mom and dad for three months at the age of 17, uh, living with a roommate. And uh, different people from Canada, U.S., Belize, in Chihuahua there that I didn't know anybody from, Durango youth. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I just got to know a lot of different people. It was an amazing time. I learned a lot. I studied the scripture like, from what the classes I had. I just I just dove in there again right away, studied a lot. And so, so that would have been, would have been yeah, I would have finished in April. But even that, so even that year that my dad was out of prison, after the first year of being in prison, I would call home those three months every now and then, talk to my mom and my sister. And she said, my, my young sister, one younger than me, we were really, really close. And so she would tell us, say, what dad was up to and where he was out. And he was gone sometimes for weeks on end again. Um, so you guys already knew he yeah. was up to his old ways. Yeah. And so that was always hard to know what to do with that. Coming home from school in at the end of March, early April, would have been end of March, early April. Must have been home for two weeks, and uh, a typical Saturday, Thursday, I had to. We had to go. They had the Bible study on Thursday nights at the church. It was the first one, I think, for the season to kind of get to know what the adults were going to do for Bible study and the youth and the children. My dad wasn't home, and I was 17. I wanted to go. I was going to go. I wasn't a problem going, but I didn't want to take my younger siblings with me. I was cool. I didn't want to take all the little kids with. Okay. But mom wanted me to take them with, and I was kind of. No, I don't want to. I don't have to. Then she called dad and she asked him, what's Pete supposed to do? And he said, take the kids with, go to you, go to church. But mom stayed home. And so we went all to, by herself. All by herself. And so we, we went to Bible study, came home. I had picked up a friend of mine, um, other end of our town. I would have gone back, <clears throat> past our home. We went to church and I picked up. Yeah, so on the way home, I dropped him off. My dad was there that night. And he, so I dropped him off and was going to head home and he just stopped me and said, Hey, go home. Well, I'm going to go home and go check on mom because mom's, mom's not answering the phone. So I went home and 
pulled in. I had my cousins with me in the van. They were going to get picked up, I think, from there. My second cousins, they were. And I can just part under the roof that the barn would have had the lean to, stepped out, and I uh, could see it in the dark. And they had a, a light above the door, and mom was just laying on the porch. And so I ran up, and it was just a pool of blood, and mom just laying on the floor, on the, on the concrete. And uh, just a fear rushed through me, and I don't remember what I all did. I just remember I jumped back in the van. Everyone had just got out of the van. Your kid, your siblings were all there? Yeah, they were all there, and my would have been one or two second cousins were there. And so I just jumped back in the van. They were just all out of the van, and I just took off. You left, left them there? I left. I just went back to where my dad was, just at the, at the other end of town. It, wasn't, it was maybe a two-minute drive, but I don't know how fast I was going, but I went and uh, told him that mom was at home in her own blood and so he followed me home with his truck and yeah she was dead and he how did he respond when you told him that she was in hurt hurt or something was wrong he just hopped in his truck and said, that's all a blur for me he just hopped in the truck and went home as fast as he could and so because it was thursday night, uh, thursday night a little close to 10 you know the youth uh, that were on the streets would have been on the streets and so we had a lot of commotion on our property because of it so mom was gone she was dead she was shot through her head Someone shot her. Yeah, and so um, that that night was a blur. We had can't imagine your younger siblings must have been traumatized too to yeah. be left there. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I can't speak for them. This is just my experience. Uh, so, dad, dad came home and you know he was mourning there. Um, he was he was in, in tears, and, shock yeah, or? in shock and in tears and mourning. And so we went to my cousin's place, the ones that I had with me. Went there for the night. And that night felt like it was a forever night. It was one of those oh, nights that man. I thought I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I was hoping to sleep and wake up from a from a nightmare, but it didn't happen. So, yeah, the funeral happened, and we buried her. Cops showed up. Was there any resolution in your mind at that time that they did they do a, an investigation and figure out what was happening? Yeah, police happen? came that night, so they were starting to do their investigation. And so, with it being on Thursday night, um, being there was people on the streets. Um, a good friend of mine, she was on the road that night and she had seen a car drive by our property and pulled into the driveway at our neighbor's place. And uh, a guy got out and this driver backed back off the driveway and went back where he came from, back past her house and back towards the town. And a few minutes later, she said she heard a loud shot. And so the car never came back to pick him up though. So. The way the town was set up, if he would have kept going across the backyards, he would have met up with the driver down the road. Mm. And so that's just what we figure in our heads. So it, it, it seemed like a hit. Yeah, it seemed like a hit. She yeah. was, he was dropped off to go do something, and then he got back yeah. in the vehicle and was gone. Yeah, and so, yeah, that hit the news. Uh, had we had a little, um, I mean, the Mennonite colonies had their own little newspaper, so that was all over the papers. People from Ontario had it. I still know some people that would probably have the little newspaper in there in their file somewhere mm -hmm. and so yeah that, that was, was devastating like, oh what year was that that would have been oh four yeah oh four hey yeah man yeah april oh four 17 18 years old yeah 17 going on 18 that year and so yeah um with just cut with just with just being you know coming to the lord and um you know i i trusted him and i i was at the time that's what i thought i was doing and i think i was but it was at a loss, right? And so there was three months there, uh, April to August, where we were living there still in the same house. Dad would leave weeks again. I remember he took some of uh, the younger siblings with the one time, left me and my sister, and uh, would have been a brother that would have been right after my sister. So he might have been uh, 13. Oh, yeah, yeah. We stayed at home and... Terrified, probably. Yeah, terrified, time. because I know for me, with the fear of being... In the dark, I was mainly fear of the dark and not having dad around or mom around. It was it was hard for me, and so there's a family that would take us in, and uh, the they had a guy my age, and he ended up uh, marrying my young, one younger sister. Okay, and so through all that, he started dating her uh, afterwards. But I mean, so yeah, three months passed. Dad uh, started selling things off. Stuff started going missing on the property. Um, and so with everything that went on with uh, things were things were very unclear of why mom was killed and who did it and um, and the cops were still investigating and I can remember I had gone to a wedding we had gone to a wedding uh, this would have been in August 
then I could come home, came home after the wedding. I had served at that wedding. It was a good friend of mine from the youth there. I came home, would have been to, uh, would have been around five or six to milk the cows. Like I would have done on a regular day and I wasn't around. And, um, so it was, it was odd for us not, for dad not to be around because he was not, he hadn't left for anything. So we knew that he wasn't gone far, but so we started looking for him and drove around. It took till about 10 or 11 that night where we finally got a hold of the cops or doing the investigation that they had said that they had put him in prison had caught him that afternoon and put him in prison. And so he had been captured then. For, did they say it was for drugs or was it in connection with your mom's murder? There, the, the uh, conviction was it was connection with, with my mom being killed. And so the, how it directly was involved, I'm unclear of. I don't know for sure. I wouldn't say, uh, I don't have a for sure answer on that. But there was three that were involved. Either, yeah, so the one who initiated it hired the driver and the hitman. And so... Hmm. My dad was captured that night. Must have, it must have some way been connected to your dad's drug issue. Yeah, and so that's way. that's kind of what we gathered over, the, over those three months with what he was doing, where he was going. And uh, we found out uh, shortly and through that time, we found out that my dad had a girlfriend in, uh, in a different part of Mexico. Oh, man. And she was a young girl. And so, and had a child with her already, too. And so... Man, her story just gets he was, worse, it was getting Yeah, it was getting worse there. So... With all that, I didn't know what it, it was just so confusing not to have a straight answer for all that. And so as soon as he went to prison, you know, there are seven siblings in Mexico now that don't have a parent. And I was 17. I didn't have a clue on how to take care of yeah. children. And my youngest, So just recently you hadn't given a kid, yeah. right? And my one younger sister, she would have been, we were yeah, probably a year and a half apart there too. And so... Um, my sister that got married in Ontario, she came down for the funeral, obviously in April from mom's funeral and went back to Ontario. And then when dad went to prison, then her and her husband up and left Elmer here and came and picked us up. And we just, yeah, they came there. I think my uncle had supplied them a suburban. They picked us up and I can just remember it was so quick because I was still building connections. I was still, um, I was confused at the time. Part of the revival very, of the youth, yeah, the youth at the church. And very confused. And so, yeah, I had to hop in and in Mexico I left. Wow. Not knowing if I'd ever return or not. And it was kind of at that time I was building connections. And so that was hard for me. Um, if I want, like I didn't, I don't even know if I thought of staying back, but just to stay together as a family, we just, we just all left. Now, I know you don't know what happened or who was really directly responsible, but in your mind at that time, were you blaming your dad for your mom? Yeah, at that time I would have been blaming him. And so, yeah, yeah. I remember saying goodbye to him yet in prison, you know. You went to visit him? Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm a pretty emotional guy. Every time I go see him and leave him, and I'm always in tears because I had unanswered, a lot of unanswered, and it's a lot of questions in my mind that were unanswered. Yeah. And so, yeah, we, I left it. We left and uh, came to Ontario. And so here we are living with my sister who is newlywed. Yeah. And so we lived in a little apartment in, in Elmer for a few months until we got a, a house in Langton area. So then again, I had to try to find friends my age and yeah. to connect again. So uh, Houghton Center at that time, I just moved to Burwell. Yep. And so we went, I went there, obviously, as people that I knew from the past. Obviously, I had grown a lot, and so I just knew some of the older faces would have been that my parents would have known, and so Pastor Henry Weeb was there, Yeah. and so Victor at the time had, we didn't connect back with Victor, I'm not sure where he was at the time, and we and him disconnected from then, from our childhood years, and so yeah, um, went back, so that came, we came back in uh, August 04, helped on the cucumber field for three weeks yet, that was brutal. But we had to try to make a make a living. We had to make money somehow. And so we went back to Chihuahua that that winter. It would have been 05, January 05. I went to Chihuahua again for my second year of Bible school. But that year, not so much focused on study, more focused on trying to find a girl maybe. So my, my focus wasn't where it should have been. But I went went back to Portis for a week and then got a ride and came back to Ontario. And... Um, that summer, just trying to find a job. I did my odd summer jobs on the fields. Just kind of wandering almost yeah, now trying, at that age. Oh, 18, yeah, I was wondering, trying to find friends. And so I had connected with a guy who would have been at a volleyball game in Elmer with the EMC youth from the Summer's Corners there. They were doing at uh, Jake and Nettie. 
Oh, what's her last name? I can't remember. And I was there doing a youth night on Tuesday nights of volleyball and some devotional. So I, can, I went there. And so I had a friend there from the old colony. And so my age, uh, John Jansen, it was not our pastor, John, a different John Jansen. And so me and him connected. He was from the old colony, but he was coming to that youth in search for something more than just the religious that uh, that he would have known. And then um, with that, with him, getting uh, connecting with him, there was a few other friends from the same, yeah, from the, from the old colony setting. We became friends, and uh, there was a, a childhood friend I had in Peru, and I didn't mention him, but uh, me and him grew up in Peru and there in the neighborhood, and I connected with him again in Glenwire through, at this time, 18 years of age then. And so through all that, uh, we were three or no, probably four or five guys just hanging out on the weekends and whenever we could. Not getting in trouble, not as far as alcohol went. When none of them, none of those guys were interested in alcohol and um, drugs and that, and neither was I at the time. I left all that all that behind, so we were just friends and um, goofing off like teenage yeah, boys would have done. Just having fun. And so, through John, um, we would have gone to the uh, the one time we went to the Tilsmer Volcanic Church on a Wednesday. That the Wednesday school. Oh yeah. And he wanted to meet some of his friends there and. Uh, some some of the girlfriends that were there, some girls came to the car, and I was in the car. He had a drive, he had a Camaro, so I was very low. And one of the girls was Trudy, froze. Okay. It's now my wife, and she won't admit it that that's the day that we met. She thinks it's a different time. Eh? Yeah, because I remember that girl. She shook his hand, shook my hand, but didn't look at me. But I remember she walked back in the crowd, and I just had my eye on her. It's something something, something about, clicked right? there for me. Isn't and, that uh, amazing? Yeah. Just all of a sudden, one look, and you just yeah. feel like something about this something, one, eh? Exactly, and so. We left and didn't think much of it, and I wasn't sure where to fit in. I was with the Burrow youth, but didn't make much connections. And me and John, and there's another John Newfeld and Dave, and there's a Frank Peters. We were just we were just buddies. Old colony youth, sometimes. yeah. And so we, for us, our life was Deer Creek. In the hot summer days, we were at Deer Creek, and if not that, we would uh, be bowling. We were just hanging out at McDonald's, bowling, swimming, whatever we could do. Yeah. And so that was a fun summer, and. Um, but then the one Sunday we wanted to go horseback riding, so John had invited us these girls, and I wasn't sure which ones he had invited. I didn't remember Trudy's name. I don't know. I don't think. But anyway, we went to Trudy's house to pick her and her friends up from there. And as soon as she got out of the the door, I'm like, oh yeah, that's the one. I'm, good. I'm glad then, you invited her. And I was dressed. That was a, a Ched, like my cousin would call me. I was dressed in my Mexican vest. I was a cowboy. We were going horseback riding. I had my hat and boots on and buckles. So. And she said that's when she met me, and that's when she fell in love. <laughs> and so, <laughs> something about the yeah, buckle, eh? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, we went horseback horse riding that day, and we did that a few other times. We'd, we'd go to Semco, and so I yeah. went there once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so we we started hanging out, and uh, I don't, I think from that weekend on, I made it a point to meet with Trudy, and we would hang out. She wasn't allowed to date yet, from her dad's point of view, so we would just hang out, and yeah. uh, dating wasn't it. An option. She was still pretty young. Yeah, she would have been 15 probably, oh, and my. I was 18, right? So there's a three and a half year gap between us. But I connected with her, and we fell in love. And so when she was allowed to go, go on a date, and she, her birthday would have been in January, or was in January, so she would turn 16, and I went to her door and asked her, or I took her out for supper at Kelsey's. And um, as she came from an old colony family, but her dad wanted me to at least ask him too. So oh, I think nice. in the doorway, as they're picking her up, I was going anyways, but I asked him anyways if I could yeah. take her, and he said yes. So I took her and went out uh, for supper that night, and that's how, that, and that's how we met. And so, yeah, we couldn't be torn apart. And so We're going to have to fast forward a yeah. little bit here, but okay. uh, you guys got married. You have three yeah. children? Four. Four. Four children. Yeah, so yeah, our dating lives are years. Uh, we dated for three years and some months, and we got married in the old colony. So oh, with, you went to old colony, yeah. So with me not knowing where to fit in because like I have been in the EMMC already conference group, yeah. but meeting Trudy and these friends of mine, you know, I didn't know what to think and where to leave everything. And so I did what I had, I did what I had to do to get married with her. And so she had to go through the baptism courses. She wanted to get baptized, but I knew I couldn't get, well, I'll just say Herman Boyan would have baptized me again, he says. And so, mm-hmm. um, but he says, if I didn't feel like I needed to, I wouldn't have to, but I could become a member during the same time they got baptized. I see. And so I had to become a member that That's way. That's what you did then? That's what I did. I was involved there. I started helping with Sunday school there as well. And we got married and she taught Sunday school. And so James was born nine months after we got married, our oldest. And so 
but yeah, from their life and not knowing where, where I stood exactly with uh, my Christian walk. I didn't know exactly what to do. I knew, I knew the truth. I knew the gospel, but it but wasn't forefront. And center, it wasn't like forefront it wasn't there. Center, no. And then being married now and I've already been in the old colony again for a few years. You know, I, I went through the motions. I was, as long as I was good and I went to church and I was, I was fine. I would leave the gospel and all the stuff that caused tension in the old colony, especially my wife's family at the time. I just, I would just leave it on the back side, on the back burner. Wouldn't, I wouldn't bring it up. And so, but that obviously can last for long. And so, um, my trade that I, the job that I got into as a teenager and then went on to was a roofing job. So I was a roofer all my life. And so James was already a year and we had Rachel shortly after he was a year. And they were pretty close together. And then somewhere on there, my mind and my heart started battling again. And so uh, I wanted something more. Almost like God doesn't let you go, eh? You know, he doesn't let me go. And so then, uh, then came the battle of leaving the old colony. And it took my wife a, a bit to, to go alongside. She wanted to, to be submissive, and she went along um, with it. And, uh, but wasn't comfortable with it. Not at, not at the beginning. She didn't leave until she was comfortable, which, which was good. And I didn't force her in that. I was searching, so I was, went to church a couple of different places, and knowing that I, if my in-laws found out, it would have been it was going to be chaos. And so that that all went on, and so but we left, and uh, that was tr traumatic for a couple of years with yeah. her uh, because Trudy would have been the first daughter. She's only the second. She's the second youngest of all the children, and she's got the oldest brother left her years ago, and it was like that was John. He's gone anyways, and you know, he's a one-off. But that was devastating that, to them, and now yeah. to have their. But young... the rest of them were never going to ever leave, and so now I took Trudy out of that, and so that was hard for them as a family. We were kind of there once. I know what that's all yeah. about. And so, but then leaving the church and went and going back to uh, Lighthouse at the time, then I don't think I did it for the right reasons in my heart. I did it because I, I knew the religious life, just living a good life, wasn't good enough. But then. Um, Things just started building up in me, and and think think with all this stuff with not dealing with dad, mom's death properly, and dad being in prison still, not knowing how to deal with all that. That all got brought into my marriage, and mm. and you know when you when you, once you get married and you have children, then it brings out the worst in you sometimes. All the stress and with all that that comes with that stuff started coming out, and um, I was uh, being uh, yeah so. Addicted to pornography was a thing too. In the, from the past, in the teenage years, was addicted to that. Had left it for a bit, you know, a couple months, a year on at a time. It was on and off, but then it came back in my married life and hiding that as a married man for well, that's, so that's long. That's when it really becomes personally hurtful, right? Because yeah. now so, you're not just offending God; you're offending the person you're living with. Yeah, and so that that became a nightmare for my wife, and so that was, you know, I. I was running from problems, and I remember we tried to move, we moved to Alberta for a few months. I just wanted to, I was just running. I couldn't find peace. I was running, and being in Alberta those three months that I was there, it was a nothing but a nightmare. I got into drinking heavily there and uh, smoking oh, again, and it was just. I had two children already pregnant with a third one, and so just my wife had a, she came along for the ride. Did you ever fear that maybe you'd go the same way your dad went? That was my fear. And, and that, was that, my, that was in from, my from forefront. From young on, you didn't like the direction he yeah. was going, and then yet that seems to be the where you were yeah, heading. I never to. wanted to be like him. That I made in my heart. That was my stand. This is I will never be like him, and uh, that's who I became. Hmm. And so that went on for a few years, and uh, my wife was would seek help, and we had all of our children through all this time. So this was probably a ten year period from James is now twelve. Yeah, James is now twelve, going on thirteen, and so. Nine, ten years it went on. This would have been from before I got married, but so when from mom was killed to to about ten years later. So leaving Mexico, I hadn't gone back to Mexico in ten years. It was because I had nothing left there besides dad in prison. And so I was here now, in Ontario, and um, saw the hurt that not dealing with mom's death properly, the hurt that I had with that, and with. Um, being bitter with dad and unforgiveness that I had in my heart that just all just came out and I yeah so like I said I started drinking heavily again I was still working I wouldn't uh, I wasn't an alcoholic through the day but it was a beer was a necessity 
uh, after hot days of work and on the weekends, and um, it just got worse and worse. And Trudy couldn't handle it, and uh, the pornography, it just got out of hand, too, and um, she just wanted it to stop, obviously. Yeah. And we tried, and she tried me to get to get us to go to counseling, and I had agreed reluctantly at one time, and then when it came to it, I said, nope, I'm not going. And this place we were, were going to go to, we did go to, they had like a year wait time, so she waited patiently and Man. dealt with it, and and I just kept living. And so... Then I, I knew that was coming to them because it was God was pulling on me on my heart still because it, he wasn't he wasn't letting go, and so and with my children growing up it was hard hard for me to see that because I didn't want my children to see that now but them growing up my my children seen me with alcohol and uh, and smoking I would hide as much as possible you know you, but that you can't hide forever no and and so that just hurt me but I couldn't couldn't let it go. And I didn't want to let it go. I remember... This is only just a few years ago. Yeah, this is only going back a couple years ago. So when it was really at a time where it was coming towards the end of it now, I remember Pastor John, we would have been going to Beacon at the time. We had switched from Lighthouse to Beacon when they did the split there. Yeah. And so Trudy had called him a few times, and uh, I avoided as much as I could talking to anybody that... Like, I would go to church, or, or Trudy would go, and I'd stay home, but I would avoid as much as possible because I was living in sin and in darkness. And so obviously when you... You're in church and you're with brothers and sisters who are, oh, yeah. who are wanting to help you. You don't want to be around that So at that time. But I remember John asked me, Clay, do you even want help? Because if you don't want help, then there's no point. Nothing I can do for you. Yeah, you can't exactly. force you, right? Yeah, you couldn't force it. And I said, I don't want to let this go. I liked smoking. I did. I liked drinking. I didn't want to let it go. And so then, then there's no use to try to help someone. But we got into that counseling group and I went... I didn't go out of bitterness and in spite for my wife, but I went because I knew I needed help. And we but needed there's help. always a bit of a torn. Yeah. Like you want to keep what you have. You want your marriage. Yeah. But you also want your sin. You want yeah. to continue mm-hmm. on, right? So it's not like everything and you said, no, I don't want to be yeah. helped. Yeah. So we went and yeah, so that, that counseling obviously brought back all the childhood fears and uh, traumas and then mom's death. I didn't want it to go to that. That's yeah. what I wanted to keep because I had already said for years, I've dealt with it. I'm done with mom's death. Like I'm, I've dealt with it. Um, but I hadn't. I just stuffed Did it. Did you ever talk to Trudy about it? Not much. There was, you know, usually around the Christmas season, you know, I would get emotional. I would, there was times where I would cry. and But there was, I would do that once a year maybe. But I would just stuff it. And But yeah, and usually when, when that gets when that topic got brought up and with dad it was never never easy and never yeah. good it was so i would stuff it more you right. say emotional like you would you would cry and such or were you more yeah no uh, they throw your temper tantrums no with no with, with mom then it was more like of missing her and you know she died yeah. like she died way too young she was my age than i am, than I am today yeah. 36 i think she would have been and it's just that was way too young for a, a mom and a lady like that and so but yeah so that had to be dealt with at the uh um, counseling that had to all come out and that came out and so just for me and my wife to go through that together she had some baggage too she had to deal with a little bit but just the healing that we could have with mom's death and the emotion that went along with all that and the heart being shattered and broken I didn't know how to love my wife and my children so I was battling all this with a broken heart and never had gotten it fixed and by the only one who can fix a broken heart and so just to allow God's healing that that weekend, that week that we were there, just to allow all that to heal, to start healing. Not, Do you mind sharing that ministry? What That would have been Caring for the Heart caring ministry. Heart. I yeah. was going to guess that. Yeah. And so we went there, and so that all came out that weekend, and we, you know, that's where the healing started. It doesn't, it didn't happen over that weekend, but it's, that's where it started. And so, but I had still, I still, I was still smoking. I hadn't let that go completely, and the alcohol was down to minimum, just, you know, the weekend thing. Not that it was the biggest issue for me, but I came home after that weekend and I didn't want the, the cigarettes anymore either. I figured, you know what, I'm done with this too. So I stopped, I threw the smokes away and from then I haven't gotten touched them again. So I left them alone. Um, alcohol has always been a bit of a toss up for me. Um, because it was not, I was not an alcoholic to the point where I drink day in and day out, but at the same time, I never felt a clear conscience before God and, and, and to have a have a beer in my hand at the same time. Mm. And so 
me and my wife made a decision to keep alcohol out of our life for the time being, and we've had it with like the that. history you have. Yeah, with the history we've had, and everything. And there's no sense in playing with that. No, no sense in playing with that fire, kind of fire. So I won't condemn can condemn someone that has a has a beer. But I mean, I just for for me and her, and for my personal no, that makes conviction, total sense. We left that at the at the door there too, and so. For them, from and, there, and you you had a lot of ups and downs back yeah. and forth, right? So yeah. you can't so, you can't trust yourself. No, exactly. And so, so yeah, the the healing started from there with the emotions and stuff, and just being able to love my wife and to to know how to connect on a on a intimate level and just emotional too, where we can just get to know one another and to grow closer together. And these last three four years have been wonderful, and just wow. and they're still just improving. And so with all that, you know, being a beacon at church there, you know, is a small church growing and growing fast. And so I wanted to be involved. And so I got involved with the church and um, doing, I was helping along with the worship team. I still do. You asked me to come speak at the yeah. youth this yeah. last summer. So, so you were yeah. involved with the youth. So. Yeah. So I got involved in with the youth. Uh, this December would have been two years now that I would have done it now with the youth group. And so it's been a blessing. It's been a Roller coaster too, because as soon as we got elected in with the youth, then uh, COVID hit, so then we had to kind of battle that ups mm. and down. And so, um, but it's been a blessing to see the, the youth grow from when I got in at probably 15 students to now we're at 60 plus, sometimes 70. Whoa! On a regular Tuesday night, and so that's a big group. It's a big group, yeah. And so, so one last thing, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. I, I know you told me in the summer that after your dad was released from prison, mm -hmm. you actually went down to Mexico. Yeah. So. Um, so James is 10th birthday, so he'll be 13 now in May, so it'll be three years in May that he's got, he, he, he came out of prison. And so. this was probably just after you started being delivered yourself? Yeah, it would have been shortly after, maybe close to a year now. And so I flew there, um, I, we had, I had gone to Mexico twice with my wife and children to visit. And so at one point I wanted to move there again. I figured, you know, I don't want to move there, but this was at the time where I wasn't, wasn't walking with the Lord, but I wanted to move there and. But that was the time where I was turning out to be like my dad, and the one I didn't want to be like, that's who I, who I was becoming. Because my dad had never met my wife and children till the day I came there after 10 years later of not seeing him. But yeah, so I went there for his release. And so, um, and that's just kind of where I left it. Um, just a final goodbye there, too. I just said, we've had our ups and downs. I've been here a few times. We've talked about uh, mom's death and not having a clear answer of who and why she was gone. But I just told him I'm done with, I don't need to know the who, I don't need to know the why. I just need to, you know that I have forgiven you and I'm leaving it in God's hands. Mm. And so I want to be a son to my dad as long as he's alive. If he he can't come to Canada, he's on parole basically, he came out of prison and you know, he's on parole. And he's living there now. He's got a wife there, a Mexican lady but no children around him from his siblings, like from his uh, his children, from my siblings. And so, so yeah, I haven't seen him since uh, he got released. Hmm. And so... But was that an emotional meeting, meeting him again? That was, yeah, it, it usually is. I mean, the meeting him isn't always an emotional part. It's always the leaving for me. It seems to be the leaving part for me. It's always emotional. And so, but yeah, I left it there where we, so we you, can talk openly. You find now, though, you've, you've found your rest in who God is and him, him being your father? Yeah, that that's a big thing that I had to come to realize that God is my earthly father, and um, because He does say that 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 He is going to be the father to the to the father to the fathers, yeah. And so, and technically, you were for the yeah, first ten years, and yeah. then later on again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, yeah, just just to come to peace uh, with God, and that He will guide me through it all. Um, it's been a been an amazing journey, and it's getting. It's just growing every day still. How do you how do you deal now with with your temptation to to anger, to frustration, to to temptation maybe to to alcoholism or going back to your old ways? With the alcohol, and that I you just put it out of the home and you I don't just put it out of the it. home. Um, I I have told my friends that there I still have some brothers in the Lord even, but those that will have the occasional beer, I said don't tiptoe around me. I don't want to be that guy that. Yeah, if, but you don't want to you don't you don't want to be a stumbling block to someone. But at the same time, I've told people don't be, don't tiptoe around me. Don't try to hide it from me. But at the same time, you would say no, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you can mm -hmm. offer me one, and and it's been happens often or not often, but 
Yeah, it's inter- interesting how it works out. When you put certain things out of your life, God changes the circumstances too. That the people that would do that, they're not in your life so much because it's not important to you anymore. And yeah. so, my close friends and and brothers and Lord that I I serve with and that I'm I get that I get together with, it doesn't have to be around the a barbecue as often as it used to be or, yeah. or at all. It can be Alcohol just, doesn't have to be yeah. the central thing. Of no, it. and so that part is not the biggest temptation for me anymore, even though, yeah, it's hot summer days. The, and... the beauty for me of the gospel, if I can kind of finish mm-hmm. with this, it says that henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yeah. Though we knew Christ after the flesh, henceforth now know we know him no more. Like yeah. when you came to Christ, even though you didn't always live this way, mm-hmm. all that Pete Harder is, was yeah. baptized into the Lord Jesus. Yeah. When he was there hanging on the cross, he was being crucified yeah. as the drunkard, as the alcoholic, as the rebel, yeah. you know, yeah. as the fatherless. He, yeah. was, he was destitute, yeah. forsaken of his father, yeah. and that was all for you. Yeah. And so the old man was completely put off. Mm-hmm. He's done and gone. There's yeah. no more. There's no more old Pete Harder. Yeah, and that that was a revelation for me. Even these last few months, uh, reading the scripture out of Hebrews, where it talks about that he was bruised for our transgressions and he hung on the cross. He, he bore our sin, and He despised the shame. Yep. And so all the shame that I carried along with the, with my life, what I did, I did wrong, you know, the, the shame of that all is, is taken care of too. Christ bore that shame. Amen. And so I can live freely before Him that I don't have to... That's the shame that, that I felt, that Satan's dark blanket hanging over you and just trying to keep you in a corner. You're not good enough. You're ashamed, ashamed of yourself. And of course you're not good enough. Exactly. And so, but with the Only robe of Christ. Christ, right? The righteousness Amen. that he gives us. And so the scripture that I, that I really like, when I'm just going to pull it up here, I don't memorize it, but it's uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 3, 4 and 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Amen. So that has helped me even uh, with dealing with pornography, you know, bringing every thought into captivity. Yeah. And rough, and, and living in the in the flesh, we do not war with fleshly objects. Um, we, we live in the Spirit, and, we're, yeah. and the power that Christ has given us in Him it's just becoming real to me more and more that the power that I have in him. In well, I, I hope this continues on now, yeah. the last three or four years of your life, that yeah. it just progresses and your wife and yeah. you can raise some good boys and girls. and Yeah, three boys and a daughter. Give them the, the, the love of the father that you never yeah. really had. Yeah, and that's been key for me um, to be there for my children as much as I can. Um, mm. I feel like I feel in that a lot of times, but I mean, I do what I, I can. And that's again, you come yeah. again and again to the throne of grace, recognizing yeah. that I'm not good enough, I didn't yeah. do well enough, I failed here again, but mm-hmm. thank you, God, that for the great sacrifice yeah, that exactly. you made for us. Yeah. And you rejoice in that, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. all right. Well, we're gonna close it there, but okay. I appreciate you appreciate coming. It. Thank you. All right, God bless. You too.